Dear uh, Chairman, thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I might be one of the elephants in the room because uh, I am a bureaucrat in uniform and only a part-time researcher. On the other hand, uh, I had the privilege to spend some years uh, in Rome, <laughs> finishing in 2019, uh, working for the NATO Defense College and at the same time studying from Professor Marchetti and Professor Fabrini at Louise University. So uh, I had that time uh, first a Polish two-star general as our commandant. I had a Czech dean. Uh, I had earlier a Slovenian dean. So at least uh, this feeling is uh, familiar for me. On the other hand, our topic is uh, about uh, hard choices. And my hard choices uh, was to sacrifice uh, my freedom of speech because of the time limits. So uh, I will uh, stuck uh, to uh, my written uh, lecture. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is my great privilege and honor to share some thought with this audience uh, presenting a Hungarian perspective about the constitutional level, level regulations of emergencies or according to a more country spe uh, specific conceptualization, the special legal order. Personally, as a military lawyer and PhD of political science, I have been focusing on theory and practice of the military-related parts of the Hungarian constitution for more than 30 years. For a long period of my career, it was not a possibility to contribute uh, to an international conference, which is dedicated to the comparative aspects of such a theoretical element of a national constitution. I remember two academic meetings. The first was at Ötvös University in Budapest in 2015, where we debated about the possibility to separate regulatory issues belonging to the emergencies from military-focused rules uh, of the Act uh, on Home Defense. A bit later, in, tw in 2017, at Pazmány Catholic University, we considered new, not necessarily military-type international security challenges of hybridity and the potential reactions from the state side even in circumstances of simultaneous challenges. We started to collect and connect some parts of the puzzle because we had a feeling that something wrong might happen which needs to remain manageable at state level. And the government and crisis management capacity became challenged by COVID pandemics very soon after. COVID became a practical test of theoretical considerations. According to a generalized point of Venice Commission's report from 2020, I quote, few, if any, states have felt that their existing emergency laws are adequate for the present emergency and have chosen to create a new type of special emergency law or have completed their existing laws dealing with infectious diseases with additional powers, end of quote. Dear colleagues, only some years, some years after the mentioned two academic debates, our knowledge is much deeper and broader now, connecting the topic with examples and different regulatory solutions of mass migration, terrorism, COVID pandemics, cyber and kinetic attacks, reaching the threshold of even a full-scale war. On the other hand, the initiated governmental and parliamentary solutions have been challenged at different levels before constitutional courts, at EU institutions, or even at the European Court of Human Rights. During the last three years, theory and practice of emergency regulations have become, and become a focus of the debates dedicated to rule of law theory also. Our road, starting from a marginal question of legal theory, has become part of the everyday reality also. It took nine years for the Hungarian Constitutional Court to decide on the possible separation of emergency regulations from military-related issues. In contrast, only in 2021, the court had almost 60 new emergency-related cases, and they were able to close more than 40 different files, 
starting from connected data regulations to vaccination and obstacles of different professions, from mandatory mask regulations to the banning of public demonstrations. On the other hand, our Croatian friends had to manage the directly opposite logic of restrictions caused by pandemic and devastating earthquake simultaneously. Many examples, challenges, practical considerations. Our world has changed and our topic became highly politicized. And now Hungary is at crossroads. The ninth and 10th amendment of the fundamental law will enter into force and uh, should fu uh, function from 1st of November this year, so one week from now. Accompanied by several modified and brand new acts and governmental decrees. We practice almost constantly the different restrictions of state of dangers caused by COVID pandemics or effects of the, uh, the nearby war with a hope not to reach consideration of state of war. My task is to summarize the fundamental changes of the Hungarian system in 20 minutes. It's a demanding task. I will present a Hungarian perspective of the debate from a participant side and not necessarily the official Hungarian perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, to present relevant aspects of such a complex and politicized part of our new reality, I have chosen 10 key elements, uh, which are specific symptoms of the current Hungarian public debates. Point number one, current trends. As the title of the Hungarian chapter uh, of the brand new book about emergency powers in uh, Central and Eastern Europe by Ma Model Institute shows, we try to reduce the extreme complexity of the constitutional SLO chapter currently. As the time of regime change in 1989-1990, the Hungarian constitution consisted of only three categories. State of national crisis, state of emergency, and state of danger. New types of special legal orders were added to this system in every decade answering different challenges from abroad or questions originated from conscription. So we have currently three further options, unexpected attack, state of preventive defense and state of terrorist threat <laughs> in order to manage the different situations with proportional toolkits, avoiding escalation at the same time. On the other hand, only state of danger was used in practice until now accompanied with some quasi-SLOs because of the challenges of mass migration and pandemics happening simultaneously. From 1st of November, we will almost return to the starting point with the extended and renewed three categories of state of war, state of emergency, and state of danger. The first, the first two alternatives may be decided by the supermajority of the parliament, and the last one uh, by the government and may be extended by the extended majority of parliament. By the way, the length of the text of this chapter in the fundamental law became even longer than earlier. Point number two, new type challenges. According to the legal concept of the emergencies, a special legal order might be considered if a challenge is not manageable according to the normal regulations of a constitutional system. Perception of challenges comes first, then consideration, and then the application of the available tools. <coughs> the aim is to return to normality as soon as possible measured against the restrictions. It's a balancing game at multi-level battlefields. Point number three, different system of legal categories. There is no unified international system of emergency related constitutional categories, only some similarities can be traced. The connected human rights agreements and their judicial review is much more about limitations and examples of failed considerations than about successful problem solving. The relevant human rights cases are borderline questions connected with changing standards, considering the local political background, much more than focusing on consequence management. Part of the problem is conceptualization of the reality with translated or even misinterpreted texts and practices. 
And evaluation made years after the management or mismanagement had happened, uh, based sometimes on con counterfactual would have been type perceptions. Point number four, modified roles of the relevant actors. Who and how decides, who might hinder which decision, and how is possible to correct the mistakes. What is the role of political on legal checks and balances, and uh, how are the legal possibilities used or misused? Core of the dilemmas is efficiency versus inclusiveness. A new system should draw a line between roles belonging to decision side and to correction side. side. It's obvious that the new system is timelier and more effective, even more transparent than the earlier overcomplicated regulation. Whether co-decision makers and corrective powers are effective and efficient enough seems to be debated for a long time, elucidated by precedence of the Constitutional Court. Intent of the Ninth Amendment was to balance governmental efficiency against a broader judicial review. Point number five, aims of special legal orders as a legal tool, toolbox. I strongly believe that the uh, system of SLOs is not a panacea. It is much more an optional toolbox to solve the actual security challenges and their effects on a bit extended way. On the other hand, although it is supposed to de-escalate the situation, it might extend the challenges toward different type of challenges or broader magnitude. Two mistakes might appear at the decisions phase. First is not to introduce a special legal order if it is needed. And the second is to overact this situation. Typical political questions without shortcut answers. Point number six. Connection of special legal order and quasi-SLOs. One possible option is to create different crisis management tools without reaching the threshold of special legal order. This will broaden the efficiency of the daily peacetime restrictions according to bit extended necessity. Only one step is missing at this solution. No special legal order is announced, but stricter regulations might reach similar effects. Proclamation of an emergency regime might even be a more symbolic part of the political consideration if it is not accompanied by derogation of rights according to Article 15 uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights. There are two possible options ahead. Restrictive measures introduced in a state of danger but without derogation should fulfill the same fundamental rights standards as a state of medical crisis as quasi-SLO. Both arguments might be challenged and proportionality seems to be the key aspect. Although regular change between special legal order and quasi-SLO might be an adequate answer if the challenge has different up and down phases. Comparing both amendments, the ninth one was one step towards quasi-SLOs. The tenth was about making easier to introduce a state of danger. Limitations of special legal order, alter checks and balances. An SLO in force and lacking derogation of rights at the same time means two different points of reference. Restrictions introduced by a state of danger but without derogation, that was caused by COVID or by effects of a neighboring war, uh, are measured against SLO standards of the Hungarian fundamental law but against peacetime standards of the European Convention on Human Rights. Two different standards might cause opposite considerations about necessity and proportionality. Might it cause a valid critique against the content of the Hungarian Constitutional Court's decisions? I hope not. Two different standards uh, mean possibility of two valid considerations with opposite ends. Even percentage of successful complaints is not a real index, neither expectation related to the length of the procedure. The Hungarian Constitutional Court was able to consider different legal concepts and argumentations urgently almost real time. 
Their dogmatical outcome should influence the future regulation and practice of different emergencies also. Point number eight, necessary and proportional restriction of individual rights. <coughs> After failing to list all the potentially needed restrictions in the Constitution, tests of necessity and proportionality became the central categories of the new Hungarian SLO approach. According to Pál Kádár, head of the Governmental Defense Administration Office, quote, in the practical application of the rules uh, in force today, the measures listed in detail have been uh, proven to be too rigid in a number of cases they fail to meet all potential challenges, and in some cases, fail to specify exactly what may be required." End of quote. Focusing on the new system, he, he added that, uh, quote again, the only limitation in the uh, is the principle that measures must be necessary and proportionate. And if the desired objective is achieved by a less severe restriction, that solution must be used. Graduality here is therefore ensured by the declaration of principles, not by the prioritization of measures." End of quote. To sum this point up, instead of strict predictions, broader definitions and theoretical considerations have been incorporated because according to the Venice Commission on France from 2016, quote again, it's hard to predict and de uh, describe an emergency situation exactly. A degree of vagueness in the definition would thus appear unavoidable." End of quote. We will see the practical effectiveness and, uh, uh, at regulatory and governmental side and consequences from judicial review. Implementing this new approach <coughs> seems to be challenging. Point number nine differentiation between theoretical toolbox and practical application. Turning back to the Venice Commission again, we should differentiate uh, between two categories. Quote, activation only entails that certain emergency measure can in general be taken. If the concrete situation so necessarily requires and application in turn means that the measure is taken. The distinction is important because the principles of necessity and proportionality are specified differently in these two stages." End of quote. Although operating the new system might be a harder challenge from a bureaucratic perspective, the combination of different principles is supposed to lead to a more balanced way of thinking about emergencies and the specific restrictions applied. Closer to necessity, proportionality and temporariness with the aim turning back to normality. Ladies and gentlemen, we turn to the concluding part. Point number 10, systematic evaluation of the new regulation. I haven't told yet one last argument which was mentioned as a critique regarding the 9th and 10th amendment of the Hungarian fundamental law that they both were decided and seemed to be implemented in a time of state of danger after a relatively short parliamentary decision-making process without inclusive public debate. I believe that uh, my point showed many considerations regarding the desired end state of this complex reform. Its elements might be challenged, but the big picture shows a more effective system which is supposed to be able to manage different, even brand new security challenges as well. So the criticism is much more about how and less about what. As a closing remark, I hope that uh, the defense and security reform will not fail. Because according to Brigadier General Kadar, and it is my last quote, a failure would have a direct adverse impact on the functioning of the country and the security of the population, which could, in extreme cases, lead to a direct violation of our sovereignty." End of quote. On the other hand, we will need some years of practice to be able to evaluate the added value of the new decision-making system from the perspectives of the extracted, more modern, simpler, and more expedient governmental practice. Thank you very much for your attention.